Welcome back. Let's bring you live to Grange Kong and Bolton. Last, our reporter Diane Connor is standing by there. Diane, you were involved in that cat and mouse this morning with Murphy. Uh, perhaps you want to tell us a little bit about that and where you last actually saw him disappear to. Yes, Alan, well, we, I got to um, Arbor Hill just as he was being released and he got into the taxi and headed off down um, along the Keys in Dublin, along the Keys, and then went up northwards. Now, the Garda helicopter was actually following him at this stage and there were a number of photographers on motorbikes. They managed to stay with him. We got lost at some stages. We, we couldn't keep up with him. But um, he went up towards Dublin Airport and got to a roundabout there, but then kind of came back on himself and went to Coolock Garda Station. He went into Coolock at Garda Station and made a complaint to the Garda about being harassed by the media, about being followed, um, the, 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 the motorbike cyclists that were following him. And he was in with the guards there in Coolock for well over an hour. Uh, we were outside and when he came out, we just filmed him coming out and I just, you know, tried, tried to talk to him, but he wasn't talking to anyone at all, just kept his head down, got into the taxi and went again. And we were following him because we really wanted to see where he was going, what his plans are. A lot of people are concerned about what he's doing and wh where he's going to live. Um, at that stage, he had headed in towards town. We got word that he was going along Gardner Street. And then he arrived toward the, near Grafton Street and it was just by Grafton Street there that he hopped out of the taxi and ran into the crowd. Um, he was last seen then. A security guard at Stevens Green said that he saw somebody matching his description you know from the photographs there and, and shots okay. of Larry Murphy that he was wearing quite a distinctive jumper. So he said he saw him going into the green there. Briefly, Diane, a meeting's getting underway very soon. They're concerned residents. What have they been saying to you today? Well, there have been many, very many worried people here in Bolton Glass. I was talking to a few, uh, a few people earlier this afternoon and just in the last hour as well. But they are concerned and some, many are worried that he will come back here to Bolton Glass. But the signs really we're getting is that it's probably the last place that he will actually come to. Um, you know, he doesn't have much contact with many of his family, with any of his family members. And um, so it, it's quite unlikely that he would come here, but it's unknown where he will go. And this meeting is due to get underway at about 8 o'clock, uh, but a handful of people have gone in so far. And they're, they're planning to voice their concerns, really, and to see what can be done, um, if, if anything. And they also want to get a group of people together who can liaise with the Gardaí here, just to keep everyone up to date on what, what the Gardaí plans are. He is being monitored by the Gardaí, and the Gardaí, I'm told, do know where he is this evening. OK, Diane, thank you for that. Joining us uh, from Bolton Glass this evening, Cahill, the media, some people saying the coverage of this story, particularly in the tabloid media, is bordering on hysteria. Well, this is, I suppose, the PC brigade are often going to come out in a, in a situation like this and, and I suppose, jump to the fence of someone like Larry Murphy. But it's important to remember that this, isn't, this hasn't been media-driven. This has been driven by the public. Back in January or, or even earlier in this year, a, ca a Facebook campaign was set up by members of the public and that had 10,000 members. This was long before the media even had an interest in the story or it was even looking, turning their radars in that direction. He's, um, it's also important to remember that this man is a very high-risk offender. This isn't your regular prisoner who's robbed a bank or not diminishing that crime in any way, but walking out on the street. This is a very serious offender who, despite spending ten and a half years behind bars, has never once sat in a counselling session, never once shown any remorse for his crime, and never once shown any intention that he doesn't plan to do something like this again. So I suppose if this, this is interest is generated from this, and I suppose people want to know where he's going now. People, want to, people deserve to know where he's going now. They want to know where he's going, what he's going to be doing, and if ultimately he's going to be moving in beside them. I'm sure a lot of your viewers will feel the same as well. Okay, um, Tom, I suppose it's fair to say that you have friends where you live who have essentially turned against you, guilt by association, I as have. a result of this. I have friends that have come to the door to me tell me, you may sell up and get out of here. There's nothing here for you anymore. You're not wanted. I have people that come up to me, knock the door, I mean, ask you, are you taking in Larry? And you make an answer, no, I'm not taking in Larry. The next question you're asked is, where's Larry going? I don't know. You must know you're his brother. I don't know. I know nothing about him. And I try to tell these people, but they don't want to hear it. However difficult it is for you, you have children, both young and, and some who are a, a little bit older in their teens. How are they coping? My eldest child is very knocked about with it. Um, he has to face back into school. And his fears is his peers are going to be on to him about it. 
and basically he doesn't want to go back to school, but he has to go back to school and I want to get settled down and that's why I'm here in this studio tonight. That child has to have an education and he has to go to school and I want to get settled before he goes back in. He needs his education and it's not fair on him and it's not fair on the two younger kids either. The other child chap is eight years of age and I have a little girl of seven. And the eight-year-old understands part of what's going on because he's asking questions. Daddy, why am I being run upstairs when somebody comes in? Because you can't let him hear what's going on, but children will be children. They will pick up bits and pieces and they'll sense there's something going on. Now, the child's seen the guardian Shikana coming in and he run upstairs with fear when he's seen him. The child is wondering why these angry people are at the door. And at the end of the day, it's down to one thing that I can put it down to is there was a big spread on a paper, can't mention any names, and it put a picture of the house, it labelled it with a name, put me as taken in Larry, and it really and truly tore our lives asunder. And Is that not abated though, because I mean, you have spoken at length about you not having any association whatsoever with your brother, but yet it still continues. It's, there's a certain element of it there still. You have people pulling up at the gate, get out, looking at you, staring up at the house, like we're prisoners in our own homes. And I'm on the television tonight trying to tell these people he will not be coming to Barton Glass to stay with any of us. How long more can you live with, I suppose, the stigma as a result of your, your brother's crime? Or what will it take for you to say, I've had enough, the only thing we can do is leave, leave the area? Well, you can get up and leave the area. You could go down to the far side of the country, but still the problem will follow sooner or later. Someone on holiday, someone has a relation there and it follows on. It doesn't go away that easy. I'm curious to know what would it take for you to sit down across the table and have a pint, have a conversation with your brother? I wouldn't. Under any circumstances? Under any circumstances, sit down with him. Because I sat looking across the prison desk at him. I couldn't get answers. What if he, he told you he wants to give you the answers? Well, if he wanted to give me the answers, he would have given them to me in Arbor Hill. He's not going to give them to me at this stage. I had to find it out for myself. He wasn't man enough to sit behind that desk and answer straight questions when he was asked them. And I don't think he's the man to answer them now. He hadn't even the manners this morning or the decency when he come outside that prison gate to say sorry to the poor girl. Do you love him as a brother? No. I want nothing to do with him ever again. And I'm on public television saying it. I want nothing to do with him. I don't want to see him and I don't want to hear from him. Okay, before we leave you, this is what FBI Special Agent Mark Safiric, a profiler who analyzed Larry Murphy's case, had to say. There will very likely be a next time. The community, he said, is quite right to be worried about what he described as this psychopathic behavior. He added that the ferocity of his attack is a great cause for concern. Offenders, he said, who engage in excessive injury of their victims are engaging in a need-driven behavior that will likely be repeated in future crimes. That's where we leave it. I want to thank both my guests, Tom, and Carl, thank you for joining us. That's it for now from this TV3 news special. Good evening.